Welcome to lecture 1.5, dual vector spaces. Throughout this lecture, let x be a vector space over a field k. A scalar function is any function from x to k. Now previously, we've talked about what it means for a function, let's call it f, to be linear, a function between vector spaces x and y. Now remember, if the dimension of x is finite, let's say it's n, that means that x is isomorphic to k to the n. So a scalar function we can really think of as a function from k to the n, at least in the finite dimensional case, to k to the first. So it's really a special case of this type of framework. That is, if we assume that they're linear, and all of the scalar functions that we see will be linear. So a scalar function is linear, remember, if we can break apart sums and pull out constants. Of course, we can more concisely write that in one condition as L of a linear combination of the basis is just a linear combination of the image of the basis vectors. It is not hard to verify that the set of linear scalar functions is a vector space, and it's called the dual of x, denoted x prime. Now, I need to tell you how to define addition and scalar multiplication of linear scalar functions, but it's really how we define these for any functions, linear or not. So here's the formal definitions, but you know, think about if you have a function sine of x, not linear, obviously, and x squared, you know, we can define 2f plus 3g in the obvious way. This is just a function of x and it is 2 sine of x plus 3 x squared. So I'll let you check these details if you want, but it, there should be no surprises. Let's do some examples. Let's begin with the space of continuous real valued functions whose domain is 0, 1, and let's fix n different points in the domain. The following are all linear scalar functions. The first one is just the evaluation function at one of these points, so L of f equals f of t1. The next one is just any linear combination of evaluations. And finally, the continuum or continuous analog of adding up the values of a function at discrete points is an integral. So this is a linear scalar function. Now, there are analogs of a weighted sum here in an integral. So if you look up Stilch's integrals, there's a way to generalize the notion of, of just dt, but I won't get into that here. But this is something that we know is linear. We deal with it all the time, but we often don't think about it. So it's linear because the integral of af plus bg dt is of course equal to af of d t plus g um, b integral of g d t from zero to one, zero to one. For our second example, let's look at scalar functions that arise from derivatives. So I will let x be the space of smooth real valued functions. So smooth just means they are infinitely differentiable because we need a function to be differentiable, but it's hard to construct a function that you know, has five derivatives, but not six. Most of the ones we come up with in real life, like polynomials, exponentials, trig functions, are infinitely differentiable. And also, there's a technical reason. If, if we just look at functions that, that are differentiable and we take a derivative, we might get something that's not. So we're actually out of that vector space. So we want these differential operators to be maps from a vector space to themselves, not to some other bigger vector space. Um, and also, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to restrict myself to functions defined on 0, 1, because up in here, I wanted the integral to actually exist and be finite. So if, if I looked at functions that were defined on the whole real line, they might not have a finite interval, or sorry, integral on that. Now, for a fixed real number t, we can define a linear scalar function to be any linear combination of differential operators where we then plug in t naught. So 
This looks more complicated than it is. Let's take a function f of t and let's map it to, let's say, 2f double prime of 0 minus 3f prime of 0 plus 14f of 0. So that is a linear scalar function. Recall that if x is n-dimensional, then x is isomorphic to k to the n. In other words, we can associate a vector x with an n-tuple of scalars. Let's say c1 up to cn. Now, if we have any other fixed n scalars, a1 up to an, then this defines a linear scalar function as follows. L of x is just a1 c1 plus all the way up to an cn. What we are really doing is taking the dot product of, say, this vector with our vector c. So you can think of this in matrix notation as a1, as the row vector a1 up to an times c1 up to cn. Now writing things as vectors here, so this, this is L of x, is just a convenient notation for us. I like to think of it as like long division. So when you take five and you divide it into 496, what, you know, you're going up here, 5, 45, this, 4, 6, and so forth, um, writing the numbers in this form is just a useful tool for us to be able to compute an, an algorithm, a very simple process. Uh, similarly, writing these n-tuples as row vectors and column vectors is just a simple notational tool for us to see how these things work. We are just doing something that we are familiar with, which is the dot product, or multiplying a row vector times a column vector. Now, I claim that if x is finite dimensional, then every linear scalar function can be written in this form. To prove this, let's take an arbitrary such function. So let's let L be an unknown scalar function. And let's take a basis, say, x1 up to xn. So this is a basis of x. So what I will do is I will tell you exactly how to find these corresponding ai's for this unknown function L. So I claim that ai is just L of the ith basis vector xi. Now if we are thinking of vectors as n-tuples, then we can think of xi as being the n-tuple that is zeros everywhere except in the ith coordinate. So again, we don't need to ever think, we don't need to ever write things like this, but it's convenient in the way that long division um, is a convenient visual tool for a certain algorithm. So ai is just L of xi, and I claim that this works. So this, this works. So why does it work? Notice that, L, so let's take an arbitrary element of x, which is a linear combination. So let's say that L of, of c1 x1 plus cn xn, this is just c1 L of x1 plus cn l of xn. So this is just c1 a1 plus cn an. So once again, if you think of these as n-tuples or as row vectors and scalar vectors, what we're really doing here is this linear function is just the row vector c1 up to cn times the column vector, sorry, the, let's say it, it's the row vector a1 up to an times the column vector c1 up to cn. So again, it has this form because I have taken an arbitrary function and I have shown you what these ai's are. As a corollary, if x is finite dimensional, then it is isomorphic to its dual. Both of these things are isomorphic to kn. As I said before, you could think of this as associating every vector in X with a column vector and associating every scalar function with a row vector. Now, that's not what they are. These are just visual ways for us to understand them. 
in a method that's convenient for computations. Let me now show you why this perspective is even more useful. A linear function L applied to a vector x depends on both the n-tuples, c1 up to cn for x, and a1 up to an for L. Instead of using the notation L of x, which really biases toward x being a vector and L being a function, rather than the fact that these are both just n-tuples, we can use the more symmetric so-called scalar product notation L comma x. Now this you may have seen to denote inner products or dot products in other contexts, and that's one reason why we like it. So we'll talk about this more later, but for now, instead of calling elements in the dual space as scalar functions, we can call them covectors or dual vectors. Next we come to an important definition. If we have a basis for x, let's call it x1 up to xn, then there is a corresponding dual basis, l1 up to ln, with a property that li of xj is 1 if xi and xj are the same, and 0 if xi and xj are different. So we can think of li as the function that picks off the coefficient of xi. So let me show you what I mean by that. So if, if x is a1 x1 plus a n x n, then L of x, sorry, L1 of x is just a1. L1 just goes in here and picks off the coefficient. Um, a n is just L n of, of x. So L n just picks off the coefficient of x n. So if we use our column and row vector notation, then what we're really doing is, is x1 is just e1, in other words, the vector that has all zeros except in position one, and xn is all zeros except in position n, and the dual basis, um, so L1 is just the row vector that has zeros everywhere except the first position, and Ln is, is similar. So now, um, now you can really see this when you multiply an arbit, so in this example up here, what we're doing, um, L1 of x, you can think of as just taking this row vector 0, sorry, 1, and then a bunch of zeros, times a1 up to an, and you can see that you are just picking off a1. So I really want you to think of the dual basis just as I call them the pickoff functions. They just swipe the corresponding coefficients. So now an arbitrary linear function is just a linear combination of these. So if we have like 3L1 plus 2L2 minus 14L3, then what we are doing is we are taking x and we are sending it to 3A1 plus 2A2 minus 14A3. So we're taking a linear combination of the coefficients. And that's how you can think about these dual vectors or these linear scalar functions. They're just linear combinations of the coefficients. In the last few slides, I have emphasized that x has to be finite dimensional, and now I want to show you what happens in the infinite dimensional case. So let's take a vector space of all infinite sequences. We'll call this L1 of x, and I apologize for using the same notation L as I am for linear functions. This is a standard notation from analysis. So we're looking at sequences with a property that if you add up the absolute value of their entries, they're finite. Now, this is a special case of a more general family of spaces called LP spaces. So LP of R is the set of all infinite sequences that have finite LP norm. And by that, I mean the norm of, of P, which is defined as the, is, is the pth root of A1 to the P, um, should probably put absolute values here because this, this can be defined more generally for complex numbers, uh, plus a2 to the p, etc. So a standard example of this is just an L2 space. So L2 is a set of all sequences where the Pythagorean theorem generalizes. So in, in R3, now how do you compute the norm of a vector 
one, four, eight, you just take the square root of one squared plus four squared plus eight squared. So you can do that for sequences. So here the, the norm of this is gonna be the square root of a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared plus so forth, and we need that to be finite. And so we have this for all integers p. Don't let the fact that it's p um, lead you to believe that it has to be prime. So we get, it turns out that, that L1 um, is smaller than L2, is smaller than L3, and so forth. So we can define this for all P, and then we can even define this for um, L infinity. So I'm gonna call this L infinity of R, where, where what this is, the infinity norm, it's just going to be the, the maximum value, or I should technically say supremum because the maximum need not exist. You know, it, it could, there could be an asymptote. It could get closer and closer to some value. So the supremum of, of the values um, of AI. So this is, in plain English, the set of, or, so L infinity is the set of all bounded sequences. And then these things are the set of all um, sequences. They obviously have to be bounded that satisfy this stronger condition. So L1 is just, again, this, in, in calculus terms, this is a set of all absolutely convergent sequences. Okay, so now we've defined that and given some context as to what these, where these things come from, let's look at what's weird in these spaces. So let's take two vectors, y and x. So we can define the scalar product as before, just to be the, the so-called infinite dot product. And if these things are in our vector space, it's not hard to show that this scalar product is finite. So in other words, every vector in L1 of R defines a covector or a linear function. However, there are other functions. So let's take this vector z of, so one, 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 et cetera. That is certainly not in this space, but it defines a linear scalar function. So you can still take the scalar product of that with x. And if you do that, you just get the sum of the entries of x. And from calculus, we know that any sequence that is absolutely convergent is just convergent. And so that is finite. So in summary, this is a linear scalar function that does not arise from the so-called dot product of an element in here. The scalar product is what we call a bilinear function of L and X. So technically it is a function, well, if, you don't, if we identify a finite dimensional vector space with K to the N, then it's a function from KN cross KN to K. And bilinear means that if we fix one argument, it is linear in the other. Equivalently, that means that if we take any scalar a, then al comma x is a times l comma x. So we can just pull the scalar out of the first argument, and then we can put it back in the second argument. So that's equal to l comma ax. Now this is something that is kind of hidden if we use standard function notation. So this this first one is really the function the function a times l of x. The second one is a times L of X. And this third one is L of AX. This is just linearity. But what we're doing here is we are fixing L. So up here, we can think of, of course, L being fixed as before and X being the variable. But what we can also do is we can say, hey, you know, just look in the mirror. Let's fix X and think of L as a variable. In other words, this also represents a function, well, not only from x to k, where our input x goes to l comma x, but we can think of it as a function from x prime to k, where l gets sent to l comma x. Now, what is this? This is an element in the double dual. This is an element of the dual of x, which we will write as x double prime and call 
sorry, the, the, the dual of the dual, the dual of x prime. So we'll write this as x double prime and call it the double dual. Let me now write down what I just wrote up formally. So if x is n-dimensional, then every linear scalar function is of the form l comma x, where l is some n-tuple. And of course, x prime is a vector space. It has a dual. We call it the double dual and write it as x double prime. So every linear scalar function is also of the form l comma x for some, now instead of l being fixed here, x is being fixed. So just look in the mirror. Take this thing and look in the mirror and x is now the thing that we are holding fixed. So you can think of, when I say x is fixed, you can think of this as a so-called evaluation function at x. And of course, you can still think of it in the usual way as a1 up to a n times c1 up to c n. So now instead of this being fixed, sorry, instead of th the a i's being fixed and this is our variable, the c i's are fixed and this is what we're changing. So I know that's a lot of mental gymnastics to think about, but I would summarize it as follows. The key points of the dual space and the dual of the dual is if we start with a basis x1 up to xn of x, then I like to think of the dual basis as the so-called pickoff functions, as I said before. So if, if x equals a1 x1 plus a n x n, then l1 of x just picks off that coefficient. Then you can think of elements in the double dual as evaluation functions. So L, if L is in the dual space, then there is a function from, a linear function from X prime to X that takes L and it plugs in L comma X, or in other words, L of X. So what is this function? This function is really, let me call it the evaluation map at x. It just, it plugs in x. So it's the evaluation map. Now there's no reason we need to call these things e sub x. Let's just call them x because we have this notation up here. So you can think of if you fix l and vary x, you can think of that function as, call that l. But if you fix x and vary l, you can think of that function as x. You don't need to call it ex. So in other words, the bilinear function naturally identifies these duals of duals, the, the evaluation maps, with the vectors themselves. So henceforth, we will think of the double dual not just as being isomorphic to x, but as being equal to x. And the elements in there are precisely the lowercase x's that we think about in the space x. And I think we're going to leave it there. So see you next time. Stay with us.